Yeah, so I've been out in the woods preparing for uh, the talk, sort of over the fence there with the, the moss and the lichens and the trees and it's kind of bizarre over there, you know, over here there's all these thousands of people and hundreds of people and you step out there and there's no one there and it's very, very beautiful out there in the woods. And um, well, while I've been preparing, what I realised was that uh, anything I've got to say, you kind of, you'll hear it a lot better in the sound of the rain falling through the leaves out there in the trees. So um, I'll do my best, but uh, you know, it's much more interesting over there in the woods, sitting quietly in the, in the gentle rainfall. But anyway, so um, yeah, one Saturday morning a few weeks ago, uh, a group of us living at the Ekodama Centre were sitting in our kitchen and uh, news had uh, reached us up in our mountain home um, of um, a brutal attempt by the police to evict uh, the occupation of Plaza de Catalunya, which is the main square in Barcelona. Uh, the square had been occupied by uh, a social movement uh, known as the Indignats, uh, who were protesting the kind of ongoing assault on society um, by uh, the state amidst the sort of failing uh, economy. 141 people were injured in the attempted eviction, and a young young man, a young man, ended up in intensive care and rubber bullets and batons were used by the police against a determinedly non-violent protest. When the word went out that the police were attempting to evict the square, thousands of people uh, went down to Plaza de Catalunya and broke through the police cordons. And the eviction was successfully resisted. Now the police withdrew, leaving a bit of a bloody trail, um, a lot of wreckage, but the camp did remain. So anyway, discussing the news at our home that uh, morning, we decided quickly to gather uh, materials together, to improvise tables, um, to get cooking equipment together, banners, uh, climbing gear, other useful stuff. And then uh, we loaded up one of our vehicles and we headed down to Barcelona to see what we could do to help to rebuild the camp and to possibly defend this against further eviction attempts. So once we got there, once we got to Plaza de Catalunya, we put our climbing skills and our climbing gear to good use. Uh, Rob, in particular, standing there at the back, he, uh, we, uh, we got up in the trees and we rigged platforms up, up in the trees to help to make a future eviction more difficult. And um, Lou, who's uh, particularly adept at setting up field kitchens, set up and improvised this field kitchen where we started providing uh, infusions of wild thyme that we've... Uh, that we collect in our in our valley so all of that was much appreciated the saturday night was very tense um, the police circled around the square uh, there was more firing of rubber bullets but what we witnessed was an incredible level of uh, non-violent um, solidarity there were thousands of people uh, standing defiantly and proud at every entrance to the square their hands were raised and some of them held sheets of paper reading No Violencia. Every time the police approached, these you know, groups of, of people, sort of 10, 20 people deep, stood um, defiantly and non-violently, chanting No Violencia, No Violencia, and, and against these, uh, these riot police kind of set up in full sort of robocop, uh, sort of masked up kind of gear. It was a deeply impressive uh, show of collective solidarity, non-violent solidarity, especially in the face of the carnage that the police had, uh, had, had wrought uh, the previous day. The whole movement of the Indignats is, uh, is equally impressive. It's, it's creativity. It's using these large popular assemblies of thousands of people uh, in sort of uh, consensus type uh, assembly processes, setting up commissions to discuss, debate and um, to develop action in areas like education and transport and sustainability, employment, other kinds of themes. Um, in the square itself, one of the interesting, one of the beautiful things that happened was whole areas of the square were dug up and replaced by uh, permaculture gardens growing food. You know, it's like digging up Trafalgar Square, you know, planting allotments in there. Um, 
And recently, uh, there's been a solidarity uh, network established so that people are getting together to help to resist the evictions of families who are defaulting on their mortgages. At the heart of the whole thing is something known as the uh, Cooperativa Integral Catalana, which is over the last year has created this, you know, fantastic network connecting uh, organic producers and, and consumers. It kind of puts in in in, in connection um, people producing handmade goat's cheeses up in sort of remote mountain valleys, with people producing and growing uh, organic fruits in the plains of Lleida, and connects them up with ordinary people who are interested in developing these networks to ensure greater food sovereignty in their region. So if we're looking for abundance, as this festival encourages us to do, a movement like that certainly has it. And importantly to my mind, it's an abundance that engages directly with our present social reality and it refuses the narratives of austerity measures and economic lack. Instead of that, it champions the creative potential of ordinary people to create a world of socio-economic justice and a culture of compassion. So yes, the theme of the festival is finding abundance and I want to talk about how that search for inner abundance, as some of the festival publicity has it, uh, needs to remain closely linked to those outer struggles for social, economic and environmental justice. If we don't link our inner abundance with those struggles, um, we betray ourselves, we betray each other. We betray 4,600 million years of evolutionary unfoldment and ecological richness. And we betray the truly creative potential of the Dharma. So it's important that in seeking to find inner abundance, we do this in a way that, t that doesn't turn away from the historical moment we're living in. Since the failure of uh, Lehman Brothers on the 15th of September 2008, we've heard a lot about the economic crisis. Uh, the recession has fed into the deficit crisis of today. And what we're seeing is a desperate effort of government to respond through the imposition of austerity measures, cutting social spending on a vast scale. The indignats of Spain the recent popular protests in Greece, and movements here like UK Uncut are all asking serious questions about the whole nature of that crisis and the governmental response. In the last few weeks, the focus has been on Greece. On June the 29th, uh, the Greek Parliament voted through a series of measures seeking to raise 28 million euros. And the measures look very familiar to anybody who has paid any attention to the kind of structural adjustments imposed on countries like Argentina, Chile or other developing nations by Washington or the IMF. In Greece, we're seeing 150,000 public sector jobs being cut, 15% cut in the wages of public sector workers who are remaining, a massive sell-off of state assets uh, including things like Athens water, uh, electricity utilities, mining rights and of course tax hikes for the majority of people while it seems that uh, raising corporate taxes is still not really on the agenda. So these kinds of measures, these austerity measures have been voted through Parliament despite polls suggesting that 80% of Greeks oppose those measures. It's led to tens of thousands of people taking to the streets, pitched battles with the police and the non-violent occupation of city centre squares um, following the example of the Spanish indignats. Those kind of governmental actions represent an enormous democratic deficit. They represent society paying the price for, for the fi failing financial institutions and they clarify, I think, who government is really serving. But even these stringent measures seem unlikely to do the job of salvaging the Greek economy. There's a rating agency called um, Standard & Poor who have ruled that the restructuring of the Greek debt uh, should be considered a default which seems to imply that the 110 billion euro bailout crafted by the French and the German banks is likely to fail. 
and it will have a serious impact on the global economy as that ripples out through Europe. We've seen similar things going on in the UK. Those of you who live there probably have uh, you know, more stories and can sort of talk about the situation here better than I can. But it's obviously having tangible consequences. My own daughter turned up at college uh, in London for the first day last year. She was going back into education after having a small child. And arriving there on the first day, along with lots of other young mums, uh, keen and excited to be getting back to college, they discovered that a grant that had been available for several decades and that pays childcare for mothers, young mothers returning into education, had been cut. So many of those young mums obviously had to give up on their, their hopes, their dream of pursuing their education that year. Back in Spain, uh, we've seen effects of the cuts in our locality where one example is the provision uh, is the cut of 50% in the provision of medical of emergency doctors and nurses nurses for the area leaving a very threadbare cover for a large rural area but these kind of cuts in social spending are nothing new um, it's the basic methodology of neoliberal politics where more than ever Government is merely the shadow cast upon society by business, especially the shadow of the financial sector and the biggest corporations. It's no great surprise that the cuts imposed on the public are accompanied by the easing of the burden on the financial industry and corporations. The kind of crisis we're seeing is regularly used by neoliberal systems to strengthen the position of private capital. Right now we're seeing with increasing clarity just how bankrupted and non-viable the neoliberal and globalised financial system has become and especially the economic injustices that it depends upon. Joseph Stiglitz is a professor at Columbia University and a Nobel laureate in economics expresses the injustices of that system very well. He talks about how the response to the ongoing financial crisis continues to, as he says, socialise the losses and privatise the gains. When the financiers fail, we bail them out with public funds. When they win, we let them keep the profits. He points out the vast sums of public money being used to bail out the banks and the financial institutions actually responsible for the collapse, while then policies punish the public through cuts in social spending. And this kind of process is exasperating the kind of economic injustice that currently leaves 1% of the US population controlling 40% of the economic resources. Stiglitz articulates what we know, that the bailouts of the banks that are too big to fail are misguided. As he says, if they're too big to fail, they are too big to exist. And there's an obvious solution to the too big to fail banks, he says, break them up. But that solution is not a political option for governments which are really in the, in the service of the financial sector. Serious financial regulations are being resisted successfully by the well-financed lobbyists of that sector. As Noam Chomsky put it last year, in a socio-economic system where even mild regulatory measures are easily beaten back, Significant regulatory proposals, however necessary, have as much chance of realisation as significant measures to prevent environmental catastrophe. There's still plenty to indicate that we're heading towards further economic meltdown. Uh, a really graphic example is the current attempt in the United States to grapple with its unsustainably mounting debt crisis. By August the 2nd, the United States will reach its legal and constitutional limit of $14.3 of trillion of debt. Uh, that's currently, it's currently at its highest in 60 years. If it doesn't raise the ceiling on its debt, the constitutional limit on the, on the ceiling of its debt, uh, either it needs to stop paying interest on its, on its loans, or it needs to stop paying bills to pensioners and soldiers and public sector workers and other contractors. Um, neither of these seem viable options. 
So instead, there are negotiations currently between Republicans and Democrats to put together budget cuts uh, over the next 10 years worth $2 trillion. And of course, there's great reluctance to see these cuts impinging on military spending. So the US deficit is extraordinary. For every dollar spent by the government, 60 cents comes from revenue and 40% comes from an increasingly accumulated debt. So it's hard to see how that can go on. But at the same time, the consequences of a falling debt rating for the United States, the biggest economy in the world, is quite unthinkable in the system's own terms. The absurdity of this kind of situation becomes even clearer when we look at how the debt is maintained. China is the top lender to the United States. Now that might seem to give China important leverage over the United States until you take account of the fact that the United States is the top export destination for Chinese goods, somewhere in the region of $273 billion worth of goods exported from China to the States every year. So if the United States goes down, if China pulls out from providing the loans, the Chinese economy will also collapse. So many top economists describe this as a mutually assumed path to financial destruction. Well, we need to take these kinds of things seriously. We need to take this socio-economic precarity seriously. But we also need to resist being drawn into the narrative on its own terms. The situation is bad and we need to face up to it, but we need to find solutions that are not predetermined by the failures of the system itself. The issue is not how can we save the system from collapse, but rather what does this failure of the system teach us? What new possibilities might be opened up? Attempts to resolve the economic crisis in its own terms just perpetuate its irrationalities. The irrational emphasis on growth in a world with clear material and ecological limits. The irrational continued, continued privatisation of profits, creating ever greater socio-economic injustice and tension. And the life-destroying focus on the quantitative at the expense of the qualitative dimensions of life, which leads to both economic and moral bankruptcy. The only pathways out of this mess require a profound re-evaluation. Instead of unbridled growth, we need to honour ecolog ecological limits. Instead of the continual privatisation of profit, we need to generate a culture of earth democracy which ensures that resources are equitably shared. Instead of the absurd focus on numbers, we need to rediscover the qualitative aspects of life which give it meaning and real satisfaction. The current economic system is at root precarious. Vandana Shiva uses a diagram of a triangle standing on its narrow tip to, to depict its most basic irrationality. So here, imagine a lot of PowerPoint now, but without one. Imagine this tri equilateral triangle, right? Narrow tip, big wide base. Big wide top, sorry, narrow base. Go okay, this way around. At the top, the widest part of this triangle, uh, we have the global financial markets and the monetary economy. And the width of the triangle up here indicates that this is where most economic attention is placed in our current system. Lower down, in the middle, the body of the triangle, we have the sustenance economy. The sustenance economy includes the work that people do to directly provide the conditions necessary to maintain their lives. Caring for each other, producing their own food, and basic sustenance, the sharing of common resources. It includes what's sometimes called social capital. And this is the economy through which human production and reproduction is primarily possible. Now the market 
is continually attempting to appropriate the sustenance economy to itself, trying to reduce all social relations into commodity relations. But in the past, um, this was the primary economy of all humans. And in the present, it still remains the economy of two-thirds of humanity. This is the kind of economy that a festival like this depends upon. A goodwill economy. A festival like the Buddhafield Festival uh, depends upon many people coming together and giving of themselves, developing relationships, uh, caring for each other, giving their creativity. And the actual exchanges on a monetary level are actually pretty minimal. So the festival just depends on the sustenance economy. So you've got the markets, the financial economy, this big wide kind of area at the top, the sustenance economy, the markets trying to kind of you know, appropriate that to itself. And at the bottom in the contemporary system, this tiny, narrow, seemingly insignificant tip is uh, nature's economy. But nature's economy is the primary economy on which all the others rest. Nature's economy consists of all the productive and creative functions of nature, the water recycled and distributed through the hydrologic cycle, the soil fertility produced by microorganisms, the plants fertilised by pollinators. And human production um, and creativity shrinks to insignificance in comparison with nature. Our ecological security is our most basic security and our ecological identities are most basic identities. And yet, as Vandanashiva's diagram indicates, it seriously lacks attention in our contemporary in contemporary economic thinking. In our modern economic system, the underlying economies of nature and sustenance, the, which are the primary sources of abundance, tend to be ignored and undermined. There's a perpetual effort to extract more and more from nature and sustenance economies and replace them with the market. The system disinvests in community and society and increasingly deregulates resource extraction. But of course, no amount of financial liquidity makes up for dislocated communities, alienation and ecological destruction. In contrast, the sustainable economic system is one which recognises the interconnectedness and the embeddedness of individuals in social relations and of humanity in a wider ecosystem. It implies a need to turn Vandanashiva's triangle upside down, a need to reground economics within its social and material foundations. The triangle needs to be inverted so that the broad base is recognised as nature's economy. In the middle, the sustenance economy grows out of and is augmented by that, that, that rootedness in, the na in nature's economy. And at the top, this tiny, much reduced part is the market economy, which remains in a healthy economic system, you know, useful for some exchanges, but in a much, much reduced capacity. A sustainable future which values life more than profits depends on economic thinking and practice undergoing this kind of inversion and reprioritising re the natural and the sustenance economies over the market. And it, it implies a profound re-evaluation. It requires an ecological and a dharmic approach which re-emphasises the inner sources of well-being over outer sources of wealth that rejoices in the freedom that comes with simplicity, that delights in the empowerment and joy that comes from solidarity with others and celebrates the richness that's integral to a culture rooted in connection with the natural world. So, for this reason, I'm really pleased that the Buddhafield Collective chose to give this festival the theme of finding abundance and the emphasis on inner abundance in these potentially stark times. It's important that we resist the narratives of scarcity that governments are using to justify their current austerity measures, saying that there's not enough to take adequate care of the elderly, elderly that there's not enough to support people through education without accumulating vast debts, that there's not enough to enable us to afford to not rip the guts out of the planet. 
Accepting that narrative of scarcity, austerity and lack creates a vicious cycle. A sense of scarcity leads us into fear and insecurity. And the more we feel insecure and fearful, the more we respond to the world in attempts to control, to coerce and use force. And the more we relate to each other on the basis of force, the less we create cultures of generosity, the less we can give and receive freely. The less we give and receive freely in healthy cooperative community, the harder we need to work to provide just for ourselves and desperately hang on to what we have. And the more we have to work in that way for exchange, the more we feel a need to be compensated for our sacrifices. And the more we seek that compensation, the more we feel that there's never enough. This kind of vicious cycle leads to increasing insecurity and distrust. And under conditions of both real and perceived scarcity, it's common historically to see strong shifts towards the political right, um, towards nationalism and other proto-fascistic tendencies, and we do seriously need to take care. Clearly we need to step out of those kinds of cycles and find, uh, and finding a sense of abundance is key in that. The more you can recognise the opportunity life offers, the more you can help to realise that potential. And the more your life is in your own hands, the more it's an experience of liberty and play and creativity. And the more pleasure you take in your activities, the more freely you share its fruits. The more you share with others, the more they share with you, and the more thankful we are for each other's existence. And the more we love, the more we trust, the more we trust in the world, the more wonderful things we're able to recognise in it the more open we can be to its enrichment and its empowerment. So there's real value in giving attention to the inner aspects of all this. We've internalised views and ideas that perpetuate our insecurity, our fear, our self-obsession and social violence, and we need to shrug them off. But it's also important to notice that these inner shifts play out in our relationship to the world around us. They shape our relationships our communities and our shared institutions. And we need to take special care not to get too focused on just the inner aspects of the abundance we seek in a way that disconnects us from the world we share. Attitude is significant. Um, each morning when I sit to meditate, I begin by ensuring that I don't take for granted all that supports me. I try to open my heart up to the conditions uh, which, which hold me and develop a, a, a sense of gratitude and a heartfelt appreciation for those things. And this does have a real uh, value, a tangible effect. It releases resources from, from within myself. But I still need to ensure that I pay attention to whether or not we've planted enough carrots so we can have soup later in the year. I've been playing around with this kind of thing in terms of my experience of time. So whenever I feel sort of rushed, like I haven't got enough time since a scarcity of time, I feel pressurised and so on. Um, I try to, to kind of notice that and make a shift and try to create a kind of a spacious sense around even those few minutes that are available to me. Try to settle into them rather than, oh, I've only got five minutes. It's like, wow, five whole minutes. <laughs> and it really makes a big difference. But I still need to give time and attention to improving my time management skills. So while on one level a shift in attitude does make a difference, it's really important not to ignore the difference that a shift in attitude doesn't make. As sure, you know, the way we view half a glass of water is relevant. Is it half full or half empty is the classic question, isn't it? On one level, how we view it is significant, but if you're experiencing the current extreme drought conditions in East Africa, half a glass of water remains just half a glass of water, however you look at it. If you're a child in Somalia, malnourished, insufficient nutritional food remains insufficient nutrition, however you look at it. So we need to take real care not to over-inflate the difference our attitude makes. 
we need to take care, real care not to dislocate our sense of inner abundance from the outer material world we inhabit. And this danger is very real today. There are all sorts of pseudo-spiritual ideas which encourage us to withdraw from reality, leading us into realms of fantasy and self-serving mystification. Now one really obvious example to my mind, is a book that was published a few years ago called The Secret. There was a documentary produced as well, which somebody showed me. And initially I was quite amused by the uh, sort of obfuscating New Age thinking it contained. And then I was really surprised on my next visit to the UK in London to find that this uh, book had been given pride of place uh, in many of the sort of big quality bookstores across the city, across the country, it became an international bestseller and it spawned a whole branch of new self-help products. Uh, a lot of you have probably come across it. The thrust of the book is really simple. Um, there's this great and powerful secret known to the select few greats of world history. And if you learn the secret, then they say everything is possible nothing is impossible there are no limits whatever you dream can be yours when you use the secret the whole idea turns around an eclectic range of pop psychology dressed up as profound truth the central idea of what they call the law of attraction like attracts like and the mind attracts what it thinks about the idea that is that you attract your experience by way of your mental attitude. If you think rich, you'll be rich. If you think poor, you'll be poor. You get what you think of. You get what you deserve in some kind of quasi-cosmic justice system. The, uh, the prophets of the secret say, you are a magnet attracting to you all things via the signal you are emitting through your thoughts and feelings. So I don't want to undermine the value of positive thinking or self-affirmation. Uh, the Buddha was very clear that mind and mental states play a crucial role in determining our experience. We sow a thought, we reap an action, we sow an action or we reap a habit. We sow a habit, we reap a character, we sow a character, we reap a destiny and so on. But the idea that our thoughts and feelings are sending out messages to the cosmos and the cosmos responds is just escapism. While no doubt these ideas are intended to be empowering, they have the, the, the consequence of turning our attention away from the material, biological, ecological and socio-political conditions that make up our world and condition our experience. They create an over-inflated sense of ourself at the centre of the cosmos, dangerous, dangerously entrenching the habit of self-grasping. And these fantasies have a terrible shadow side. Basically, the authors and adherents to these ideas are saying that a young Vietnamese girl sitting in the compound of her ancestral village in northern Vietnam in May 1965 is attracting through her mental attitude and thoughts, napalm. Or a Japanese school teacher strolling with his son in Nagasaki is attracting, through his mental attitude and thoughts, the fetal mutation of his unborn son. Or that a young priest helping indigenous farmers in the Amazon is attracting, through his mental attitude and his thoughts, assassination. The promoters of the secret, or similar ideas, would have us believe that they were all thinking bad thoughts, that they got what was their due, that US foreign policy had little to do with it. A good friend of mine remarked, these people promoting bullshit, like the law of attraction, what they're attracting is a kick in the teeth. <laughs> now, you know I wouldn't put it like that. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far. It's given my commitment to a sort of finding non-violent pathways towards a future culture of compassion, but I can understand the sentiment. 
pseudo-spiritual fantasies like those touted by the sutra or even, even sometimes wriggling their way into certain approaches to Dharma practice reproduce the inverted triangle, the uh, Vandana Shiva's inverted triangle. Um, just like the disconnected modern economic system, they equally turn away from the grounding reality of community, society and the, our ecological roots. They replace the bubble of economic fantasy with a pseudo-spiritual fantasy. And they equally leave us in a position of extreme precarity, um, facing ecological and social meltdown. But it's not enough just to rail against these kinds of strategies of denial uh, or just to ridicule them. We also need to understand why people turn towards them. It's hard to stay open to the precarious and critical conditions of our world today. As well as economic and financial systems in extreme precarity, we're looking at extraordinary levels of militarization. Currently there's a nuclear arsenal with 2,225 times the firepower of all the munitions used in World War II. Extraordinary social and economic injustice on a vast scale, 38% of all city dwellers living in slums, and an environmental crisis that numbers and words can't even begin to hint at. It's really hard to stay open. It's no wonder that we might want to run away into escapist, mystifying, mystifying fantasies like The Secret. But that suffering, connecting with the suffering of the world, being open to that, speaks of our connection to it and can impel us to act. Rather than increasing ecological insecurity, rather than growing economic and social exclusion, we can build a saner world where people and the planet matter more than profits and productivity. We can give rise to a culture of compassion. The only thing worth doing with our lives is dedicating ourselves to the alleviation of suffering. There is nothing else. Tsongkhapa, a great Tibetan master teacher, says, So sensitive an ecology is the interdependence of all that the slightest attention and assistance to others creates moral elevation for ourselves and humanity, while the slightest indifference or neglect towards others creates moral harm for ourselves and our civilization. But it's in the synergy of our shared endeavour of collaboration that we can achieve the most and best communicate our values. It's in collectivity, in our organising and our community building that we best achieve both the transformation of ourselves and the world. Our inner abundance is important, but the abundance that can emerge between us is yet richer. So, if it's abundance we are searching for, as Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar liked to say, educate, agitate, organize. Our shared collective reality has been hard hit by recent, the, the recent neoliberal assault on the social sphere. Neoliberalism has actively dismantled the fabric of society and eroded positive community values now for decades. And we're sitting in the end game of that destructive project. Atomization and the erosion of society have pushed people increasingly into individualistic and narcissistic strategies to deal with their pain. When we lack social and collective contexts and institutions to deal with the causes of that pain meaningfully, it's natural to look for individualistic sources of salvation. So we need to reconstruct and create, uh, build communities, build institutions and pathways that can enable us to act meaningfully together. If we can't find those contexts, if we lack those channels, 
then our pain and our love get stifled and we fall into apathy and denial and superficiality. It's because of the importance right now of us building these shared and collective institutions that I put energy into movements like the Indignats. Why I put energy into uh, founding something like the Eco Dharma Centre. Why we're involved in trying to uh, support and develop the network that Lokabandu was talking about earlier, the SELA network, helping to, to um, bring ecological and social justice issues kind of in, in, into focus within the Tri Ratna uh, community. Why we're putting emphasis, uh, while well, we're putting work into trying to support what was a new strategic priority developed by uh, the, the European centres of the Turatna community, which uh, the, the, the priority being to re-emphasise the power of the Dharma to transform society. Putting energy into those kinds of initiatives is a way for me of trying to provide, trying to create real institutional frameworks that can support and help us to direct the pain and the suffering that we feel in, in our response to the difficulties in the world. Now inner abundance is vital. The basic, basic Dharma practice enables us to tap deep inner resources. Meditation gives us access to wellsprings of joy, loving kindness, mental clarity, vitality and emotional robustness. These are all qualities that will help us to stand up to, stand and face our times to be alive to our experience. But as I said, we need to create the social contexts um, in which we can discover the incredible abundance that arises when people come together in solidarity with each other and the whole of life. Our practice needs to be rooted in the ecological, the biological and the social dimensions of our lives. The idea that somehow we can practice outside of those conditions is illusory. As we know, well, when we look at this thing that we call our body, what we see in our body is an utterance of a great adventure story, the adventure story of evolution, 4,600 million years of the unfoldment of atomic beings, of supernovas, single cell life forms and ever increasing complexity. There's no separate self there, distinct from the evolutionary and the cosmological. That's our body, but our minds too emerge out of the complexity of that process, sparkling in the wonder of the subjective dim dimension seen in the nested self-organising patterns of all living things. Now, there too there is no separate self that's distinct from the biological and the ecological. The thoughts and the words which make up our most intimate reflections are born out of a socio-linguistic matrix woven by the familial, tribal and the cultural interactions of thousands of generations of our species. There too we find no self distinct from the interpersonal and the cultural. Our claim on that as me or mine is threadbare. I was recently reading a fascinating account of, uh, of children who were brought up by, by wolves. And uh, these children were found and adopted back into human society in India. And over many years they were taught to speak. They were slowly taught uh, to speak and also to stand up on two legs and to walk the way that we walk. And eventually they did adopt walking on two legs. But it's very interesting that whenever they needed to move fast, they went back down into a four-legged gait, you know, and they used the way, of, the way of running that they'd been taught by their Wolverine parents. And what I found so interesting about that was that something that, that I assume of is mine, me, you know, this way of moving, walking, right, actually is woven together. By, the, by, by these different kind of influences. You know, not only is it kind of that there's this evolutionary potential evolved in me, but actually to be able to walk, we require a social and cultural context that brings that potential out. 
something so intrinsic to what I think of as me, something so intrinsic to what we probably think of as human, is so fundamentally cultural and socially kind of created. So anyway, it's important that our practice em embraces the ecological, the biological and the social dimensions that our experience arises uh, in dependence upon. Mahayana Buddhism suggests that there's no personal salvation available to us. What is possible is freedom from separation and isolation into a radical and empowering interconnectedness. The Dharma points out that grasping after the delusion of a separate self is a core source of suffering and disempowerment and any strategies that turn away from the social, political and ecological conditions of our time reinforce that sense of a separate self. So this crisis of our times is actually a great spiritual opportunity. It demands of us that we engage, that we accept our connectedness or we perish. Liberation today, from a Dharmic perspective, is not a personal matter. It's something we partake in, something that is unavoidably shared, historical and collective. A relevant Dharma practice today is one that connects us to our evolutionary past. It's a practice that weaves us into the ecological web out of which we emerge. It is a practice which enables us to reach out in, to, in solidarity to each other. It's a practice which faces challenges and seeks to transform our social, economic, political realities. Abundance does erupt here in the everyday. In every affirmation of our connectedness, we touch that abundance. In every ethical deliberation, in every act of resistance against greed and hatred, we discover the joyful, playful, creative potential of our lives. But I ask us to ensure that we direct that abundance into shared and collective action. Humanity faces important choices. Do we retreat from the challenges of our moment and leave the trajectory of domination and exploitation to play out in a wave of collapsing environmental systems, an ever more violent scramble after dwindling resources and a dry, dramatic dieback of the human population? Or can we face the challenge unsure of the outcome, but committed to doing what we can to support the potential for a more life-sustaining society and culture, in creative partnership with each other and the living earth. Every individual and collective choice we make now will count. Thank you.